My name's Bill Tai. I'm a venture capitalist. I've been funding companies for 25 years. I happened to run into the blockchain through Bitcoin in 2010. I've uh, funded Bitfury. I'm on the board of directors and head of strategy. Blockchain is basically a chain of blocks of information, roughly 10 minutes long. And all it is, is basically an accounting ledger where a bunch of people, in this case really machines, have written down all of the transactions that have occurred in roughly a 10 minute period. And that block of 10 minutes gets added to the chain. So there's forever a chain of information of 10 minute blocks that makes up the written history of all the transactions of every time I transferred a unit of value from me to someone else and then to someone else within that 10 minute block. It's indelible, it cannot be erased because there are many copies of it and it's just the basis for low friction transactions of all types for the future. So one of the obvious areas where blockchain is going to have a very big impact, and you see it because all the banks are working on it now, is in the financial sector specific to banks. And you can use the analogy of what happened in the most recent probably 15, 20 years in the democratization of communications through the internet. If you think about what happened with the phone companies, there used to be regulated monopolies that covered certain geographies, and they basically owned that business with $3 a minute phone calls and more expensive fax communications. Once the system of flow of information through those lines was turned into little bits, you could reassemble them in ways that could do really anything and it made the system frictionless. Banks today look a little bit like those phone companies where they own a proprietary system. And if you really think about what a bank is, all it really is is a big accounting ledger. It's a big ledger that basically records who owns what when. Because blockchain is basically a ongoing record of who owns what when all the time so that everybody knows, the core basic function of a bank is about to be automated. So you'll see the banks basically remake themselves in the way they, the phone companies did to move from higher value added services other than just phone calls and fax lines to other things like the internet. So I think we've, we're on the front of a giant wave of the transformation of the way people handle their finances through banks. The other area that I can see a big shift that will also require a little bit of regulatory help, uh, deregulation, when that it's back. If you think about the phone company, and the power company, very similar industries. You basically have monopoly providers sitting on top of geographies where if you can unitize the little chunks of information, in this case, chunks of electricity through a grid and allow lots and lots of different people to have little solar stations on their home or a little a windmill here or, that, or, or wherever and have a peer-to-peer -peer energy production grid a resilient system can be formed where people, instead of selling your solar power on your roof back to the phone company at a fixed price for a few pennies, when they're selling you electricity at 26 cents and you're selling back at two cents, there should be some place in the middle where everybody can earn a little bit of income by generating power and you'll have an energy grid that cannot fall down. When Hurricane Irma blew through the Caribbean, it knocked out the central power company in Puerto Rico. Nobody has electricity for six months. In this case, you'd have hundreds of thousands of little producers. Hurricane goes through, you're still up and running. Every movement has some speed bumps or risks that it has to overcome. And I think the very power of this system is also its potential weak point. So the whole notion of decentralization, it's important and it can happen, but people have to work together. I think one of the, the, the main issues in a decentralized environment is the governance and the decision making and the madness of crowds. So when you're trying to get everybody to move in unison, it's a little hard. And so this community that we're all a part of, we have to work together. Imagine a school of fish swimming in the ocean. It's okay when that school of fish hits, hits a piece of coral and everybody scatters for a minute, but they better get back together. And I think we are in a community decision process trying to make a community decision process work for everybody for the good of mankind. And everybody better remember that because we need to stick together and whatever the decisions are that need to be made, let's do it together and make it happen. Bitcoin and Ethereum are both expressions of units of value that sit on top of a blockchain and that chain of information that records basically who owns what when. 
and the token or the expression of value in Bitcoin today resembles something like gold. It's a reserve of value that people can hold, they can transact with it. It's not super low friction yet, but it's getting there. Ethereum is a token that represents a unit of value that does also have some monetary value, but it is an expression of a developer community that is very robust and active in a kind of a higher level language. You can think of it as sort of as Bitcoin today is a little bit like DOS on an x86, and Ethereum is a little bit like a Mac in 1984. It's a little easier to work with. Developers have flocked to it because it's easy to work with. But you have a giant, massive community of people in the open source part of Bitcoin that's a little bit like the PC. So they're both going to exist. The PC and the Mac both had great futures ahead of them. And we're there now where they're both going to exist. They're going to coexist. And you'll see developments in both ecosystems. Airbnb or Uber today. There were companies you've probably never heard of in the internet days, Prodigy and CompuServe. You probably heard of AOL. Those were like private internets. There was a public internet. Airbnb and Uber are a little bit like private blockchain implementations. They're not really blockchain, but they perform the same function, which is how do you know to rent a car effectively for five minutes? The transfer of ownership happens on the software stack in a proprietary system. Airbnb, it's the same thing. Instead of a Bitcoin being transacted on a piece of software, you're transferring ownership of a rental space for a day, a week, a month. And those today, if you were to do them again, you would write them as blockchain applications on the open source stack and you'd save a lot of money in the same way that internet applications were cheaper to do because there was scale in the internet over time. You actually already are. So if you think about your experience when you took your last Uber, if you did, or your last Lyft, if you think about that system, you used to have these little like pools of black car firms, you know, town car firms. And eventually, because they got put on a software system where that dead asset was now available in a marketplace and you could basically take ownership of that car for five minutes for your ride, that is the same thing as blockchain. If you think about a Bitcoin sitting on a blockchain system, you have a Bitcoin that you can transfer ownership of from me to you to anybody else recorded on a software stack. That's the same thing as taking ownership of a car for five minutes. So you're already doing it. Do not be afraid. If you want to just take ownership of a Bitcoin to try it out, you're already there. So, so do a little experimentation and, and get with it.